Many of us are aware of the risks associated with loading and unloading bulk cargo. But it's not always obvious that the cargoes themselves and their carriage can also be a serious hazard. Some bulk carriers have loaded cargoes which have later liquefied, leading to instability and capsize. Other vessels have loaded cargoes which have suffered a violent chemical reaction, resulting in catastrophic explosion and fatal consequences. We need a way of knowing how to handle these cargoes safely by identifying any potential risks before it's too late. That's why there's a code book, which must be aboard every bulk carrier that sets out the requirements associated with complex and dangerous solid bulk cargoes. It's called the International Maritime Solid Bulk Cargoes Code, the IMSBC code, updated every two years to take into account the introduction of new commodities and the latest developments for products shipped in bulk. And it's not just another set of rules. It's an essential tool to help prevent accidents. The IMSBC code guides us about the risks from different cargoes, of structural damage, personal safety, their effect on stability, or the dangers of generating a hazard through a chemical reaction as well as procedures concerning security and cargo testing. But most importantly, the IMSBC code is there to provide reference to help ship's officers assess whether or not to accept a particular bulk cargo. At the heart of the code are the individual schedules of solid bulk cargos found in Appendix 1. The cargos are listed in alphabetical order using their bulk cargo shipping name. Each schedule follows the same format, describing the cargo's characteristics, hazards, stowage and segregation requirements, as well as any precautions to be taken during loading, carriage and discharge, along with any necessary clean-up or emergency procedures. Under characteristics, each cargo is classified into one of three groups. Group A consists of cargoes which can liquefy if shipped with a moisture content in excess of their transportable moisture limit, or TML. Of particular significance is the mineral concentrates group. Any one of these dense cargoes has the potential to liquefy with the consequent threat to ship stability. Group B cargoes have chemical properties, which, unless handled correctly, could lead to a hazard on board ship, such as a gas that's toxic or explosive. Many of these cargoes also have a materials hazardous in bulk, MHB, or dangerous goods classification, relating to segregation and stowage, as specified in the IMDG code. Finally, there are Group C cargoes, which don't liquefy and aren't a risk as a result of chemical reaction. Regardless of group, stability must always be considered. The schedules provide figures for bulk densities, stowage factors and, where applicable, the angle of repose. This relates to the maximum slope angle of the cone shape formed when loading non-cohesive, free-flowing cargoes. These are liable to shift if not correctly distributed. Some types of cargo can both liquefy and cause chemical reaction. But there are similar procedures and good practice to be followed for all bulk cargoes. Getting a cargo from source to destination is like a chain made up of links. And, like any chain, it's only as strong as its weakest link. 
The problem for us is that some of the links are not directly within our control. But that means we have to check as if our lives depended on it. Because they do. The first links in the chain are the identification of the cargo to be loaded and the suitability of the ship chosen to carry that cargo. Shippers are required to provide the master or head office with preliminary information on the cargo in advance of loading to enable any necessary precautions for safe handling and carriage to be put in place. While this should be verified when the vessel is fixed on charter or the cargo booked, we shouldn't take for granted that it's actually happened. It's always worth double-checking this information, especially as the same cargo can be known by different names, depending on where we are in the world. In line with the IMSBC code, shippers should provide a bulk cargo shipping name or BCSN, for the cargo offered for shipment. But if the cargo name is not immediately recognisable or familiar, Appendix 4 of the IMSBC code allows us to cross-reference a number of commodities and materials to provide us with the correct BCSN as applicable to the schedules. If the shipping name is still unclear, clarification must be sought from the shipper. Likewise, any relevant clauses in the charter party, along with the suitability of the ship, should also have been verified before fixture. Once again, it's worth checking for ourselves that the ship meets all criteria needed for a particular cargo. And for some cargoes, there may even be a requirement to use special equipment during carriage. We also have to make sure that we have the necessary safety gear, including personal protective equipment. It might be essential to have, particularly if an emergency arises. Checking the charterer's instructions or preliminary shipping information against the IMSBC code before arrival at the next loading port is good practice. It allows us to prepare and it gives us a clear picture as to what we expect to be loading and the information we expect to see in the next link of the chain, the all-important cargo documentation. Upon arrival, it's the shipper's responsibility to produce detailed documents and a declaration that will tell us what we need to know about the acceptability of the cargo. The IMSBC code lays down the information and certification that must be provided by the shipper, as well as trimming procedures and stowage factors. This will include the vital characteristics of the cargo. For example, with Group A cargoes, we'll want to know the average moisture content and the transportable moisture content limits for this type of cargo. We may also need to know its temperature, since many Group B cargoes must not be loaded if they're above a specified temperature. This allows us to cross-reference with the code, which lays down what that specified temperature is. There are still potential problems for us, though. There's the real possibility that the information may be out of date. This has direct connections to the third link in the chain, how the cargo has been stored and handled prior to loading. In particular, we need to know whether the documented figures are still accurate. If stored in the open, for instance, a cargo could have been affected by recent weather conditions, potentially increasing the moisture content or the temperature may have risen beyond the acceptable level since it was last measured. We need to be sure the figures we have are both accurate and up-to-date before we accept the cargo and give the go-ahead for loading. Hence the importance of the next links in the chain, 
inspection and survey. If we're in any doubt as to the accuracy of the information provided by the shipper, we should arrange to have checks carried out on our behalf before accepting the cargo for loading. These checks should be carried out in consultation with the P&I Club and the appointment of an approved local surveyor. The surveying process could involve simple inspection or it may require accurate sampling and analysis. It's essential that any sample that's taken is truly representative. Where the stockpile has been recently worked and the centre is already exposed, samples can be readily taken. However, where direct extraction from the core of the pile is not possible, dynamic representative samples taken from the conveyor using mechanical sampling equipment may be required. Whichever the case, it's important that we are there to witness the sample taking process. The IMSBC code also gives us guidance on certain tests that we can carry out for ourselves. For instance, as a rough guide, this CAN test can be used to indicate the possibility of liquefaction or high moisture content. If any doubt remains, further tests may have to be initiated, involving specialist labs and procedures. Once we are satisfied that all is well with the cargo, we can move on to ensure that the ship is ready for the next link in the chain, loading. Before loading commences, holds must be clean, dry and free from residues of previous cargoes, with the washings disposal carried out in line with MARPOL Annex 5 regulations. But depending on the nature of the cargo to be loaded, further preparation may be required. Again, the IMSBC code will give us guidance in relation to specific cargoes. For example, some may require the special treatment of the hold, involving the use of protective barrier coatings to guard against damage from corrosive substances. With all bulk cargoes, loading should only commence in accordance with an agreed stowage plan and loading sequence. During this stage, the IMSBC code naturally works in conjunction with the blue code. The blue code, amongst other items, can also be found in the supplement section of the IMSBC code. Section 3 of the blue code and the checklist in Appendix 3 clearly sets out the procedures that will need to be agreed by both terminal and ship before loading commences. These will include specific extra safeguards relating to certain cargoes. For instance, the stopping of all hot work on deck and in adjacent areas, and the placing of restrictions on smoking. These should apply to everyone, and we need to make sure they are also clearly indicated to visitors. If there are dust hazards, sensitive equipment will need to be protected. And those involved in loading will need to wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. There are also some bulk cargoes that carry a potential security risk. Section 11 of the IMSBC code contains provisions relating to security, making reference to the ISPS code and SOLAS regulations and guidance. This could involve increased security patrols and restricting access to visitors. Finally, we need to keep a close eye on the weather. All the cargoes where moisture content or chemical reaction to water is a critical factor shouldn't be loaded when it's raining. In fact, we should remember to give weather conditions in port the same due care and attention as we would to weather conditions at sea. One of the most crucial links in the chain is the time on passage. 
Whilst at sea, chemical reactions could take place in the hold unseen. Any increases in moisture, temperature or the build-up of gases will need to be monitored and controlled. Depending on the cargo, we may be required to not ventilate at all or make the hold gas tight. To make use of surface ventilation by opening the ventilation flaps, to operate mechanical ventilation if fitted, or under specific circumstances, the need to carry a cargo under inert conditions. In several instances too, we'll need to have specialist equipment that enables us to monitor for toxic, flammable or explosive gases. Gases such as methane and carbon monoxide. For some cargoes, we'll also need the means of measuring the cargo's temperature while on passage. Accurate records must be kept in order to monitor any variations or increases in temperature as the voyage progresses. The final link in the chain is discharge. This is almost a mirror image of loading when it comes to precautions about flammable gas, dust hazards and personal safety. The emphasis on the soundness of every link in the bulk cargo chain is the safety of the ship, which naturally takes in the safety of those aboard. But there is an additional aspect of safety that affects only people and is itself a regular source of incidents and fatalities. As well as many cargoes giving off toxic gases as a result of chemical reactions taking place, there are some which absorb oxygen. Every enclosed space should be treated with caution and considered at risk of oxygen depletion or toxic atmosphere. And that includes recently opened holes that may not have been well ventilated. Every ship should have clear procedures for testing the atmosphere in an enclosed space. And all of us should follow them without exception. It's the same principle as with all the decisions in the bulk cargo chain. Actions are taken only on the basis of accurate information. For us, the IMSBC code is much more than a set of processes that we have to follow. It's a practical tool for reminding us of the hazards of many of the cargoes we carry. Even if we carry the same cargo regularly, each occasion must be regarded as unique. We should load and transport nothing until we're 100% sure that it's safe to do so. Each of the links in the bulk cargo chain must be sound. We have to ensure these links are sound when it's our responsibility. And we have to check that they're sound when it's someone else's. After all, if we don't, we're the ones at risk.